all the ladies and gentlemen who have logged in today. Another interesting live webinar under the aegis of Mumbai Hematology Group. And today we have a very, very interesting title. In today's world of automation, there is still a lot to learn from peripheral blood smear examination. And all of us look forward for this wonderful lecture and interaction which follows. A warm welcome to our program director. We know him very well. Dr. Shubha Prakash Sanyal, hematologist, hemato-oncologist, transplant physician at prestigious Fortis Hospital, Mumbai. More than 22 years of rich and insightful clinical experience of treating more than 20,000 plus patients. Fellowship in leukemia, bone marrow transplantation program at Vancouver General Hospital, Vancouver. Numerous publications and paper presentations to his credit. And he's an active member of Mumbai Hematology Group. And teaching is his passion. He takes lectures for MBBS, MD, and nursing students. Even more interesting is he loves soccer, active supporter of Mohan Bhaga, associated with Ramakrishna Mission, and admirer of Prabhindranath Tagore books. I would also like to warm welcome our chief guest, Dr. Kirit G. Nayak. Introduction will be done by our program director. And also our guest speaker, Dr. Debodok Tubashu from prestigious Jibma. All the discussants, you can see their name in large number. A warm welcome to all the expert discussants today. And all the delegates who are logging in from various parts of the world. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to each one of you. May I request Dr. Sanyal to take it forward from here, please. Thank you, Manoj. Just give me two minutes just to uh, arrange my screen. Please put it on full screen. It's come. Yes, it is. Good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are, because this program actually attending by the almost uh, people from uh, 30 different countries. And it is our MHG program Sunday, Sunday session, which is very popular nowadays. So today's topic will be, in today's world of automation, there are still a lot to learn from peripheral blood smear examination, a complete uh, package between the automation and the conventional hematology training. Our guest speaker will be Dr. Dev Datta Basu from Puducherry. It is supported by Bombay Hematology Group and the Inter Oncology. Logistical supports will be provided by the Perfect Square. And my special thank you to Dr. Manoj Kumar and team Intas, Mr. Kalpesh, yes, and the team Perfect Square, entire executive committee of Mumbai Hematology Group. Our chief guest will be Dr. Kirit G. Nayak from Surat. Our guest speaker, Dr. Devda Tabasu, Jippar Pondicherry. All our discussions were themselves either eminent hematologist and hematopathologist. And all the participants for sparing your Sunday morning. Visit our website, www.mhgindia.com for all our activities. And there are two lectures, CAR T cell therapy in lymphoma, which will be again a very exciting lecture by Dr. Loretta on 30th July, Saturday, 7 p.m. onwards. And approach to thrombocytopenia and platelet count, none other than my very close friend, Dr. Kunal Segal, practical tips and troubleshooters on Sunday, 31st July, 11.30 a.m. onwards, so next Sunday. So our discussions are 25 in number. They're all spread from the different part of our country. So Dr. Akshaya, she's from Suraksha Diagnostic, Kolkata. Dr. Anjali Kelkar, 
from the Dubi Hall Clinic, Pune, Dr. Bijita Datta, uh, ESP Jeep SR Ka Manik Tala, Calcutta, Dr. Jaspita Das, Associate Professor in Hematopathology Department in Hematology, AIMS New Delhi, Dr. Jyoti Bajaj, Assistant Professor in Oncopathology, GCRI Ahmedabad, Dr. Jyoti Katwal, Sri Gangaram Hospital and New Delhi, Dr. Gayatri, he's a very leading hematopathologist from the Lifeline Taparia Diagnostic Center, Hyderabad, Dr. Nishat Thakkar, Consultant Hematologist, Okhara Hospital, Rajkot, Dr. Parimal Sarda, Hematology Clinic, Vedanta, Ahmedabad, Dr. Prashant Sharma, Department of Hematology, Professor, PGI, Chandigarh, Dr. Manchanda, Professor, Director of Pathology, KM Hospital, Pune. She's also a very, very leading pioneer hematopathologist in the country. Dr. Rajat Jain, Department of Hematology, Sayadi Super Specialty Hospital, Pune. Dr. Rajini, uh, Mahatma Gandhi Cancer Hospital and Research Institute, Vishakapattanam. Dr. Ruthvi, Department of Transfusion Medicine, Immunohematology, CMC Velour. Dr. Rama, a senior resident, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Dr. Roshini, consulted hematopathologist from Manipal Hospital, Bengaluru. Dr. Sandeep, Jairus Hospital, Ahmedabad. Dr. Seema Tyagi, Professor, Department of Hematology, All India Institute, New Delhi. Dr. Sindura, Associate Professor, Department of Pathology, Kasturba Medical College, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, Manipal. Dr. Shashi, Bhagwan Mahabir Cancer Hospital, Research Center, Jaipur. Dr. Swati Pai, Hematopathologist, Manipal Hospital, Bengaluru. Dr. Tara, Professor and Head, Nijam Institute of Medical Science, Hyderabad. Brigadier Dr. Tathagata Chatterjee from ESIS Medical College and Hospital, Faridabad. Dr. Tejinder Singh, very senior consultant, DRG Unipath Lab and New Delhi. And he has a lot of, uh, I got a lot of inspiration from him and transforming my career in hematology from him. Dr. Tulasi, Associate Professor, Department of Transfusion Medicine, Christian Medical College, Vellore. Dr. Tusar Segal, Assistant Professor of Lab Medicine, Hematology, All India Institute of New Delhi. Dr. Udayan, pathologist from Baroda, Gujarat. Dr. Bistrut, Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. So I'll be introduced Dr. Uh, uh, Dev Datta Basu, who will be guest speaker today. Honestly speaking, going, for, going before a test for a, a formal introduction, it is a really exciting day for me to introduce my teacher and the person who transformed me from a simple hematologist to hematopathology and from the clinical hematology. So I have a really a great exciting day today to introduce him and hosting him for our MHG meeting. I can tell you just two three things about him. I don't have much time. Uh, he's not only a great teacher, he's a great preacher. He makes a lot of students interested in hematology, hematopathology, and transforming them into the clinical hematologist in his entire career of, career of let's say, last 30, 35 years. There are a lot of hematologists I know who are practicing hematologists now in Mumbai, in the abroad, and other part of the country who are inspired by Dr. Teach, Dr. Basu's teaching and Dr. Basu's lecture. Two things I always admire about Dr. Basu. He's a great human being and a very strict teacher and excellently friendly consultant when I was trained in Jipman in 2002 to 2005. So our PG program used to happen just before the lunch and sometimes some bad days used to happen, you all know. And then after PG program, we're walking down the streets to going for the lunch to our hostel. Immediately a scooter used to come besides us. Man, come, I'll give you a lift. And just two to three minutes chatting with him, sitting behind our scooter is make your day again back to normal and everything back to spirit. That is the Dr. Basu's personality. He has an extremely interest in the managing the co-curricular activities, starting from our Jipmar social function, our Saraswati Puja in Jipmar campus that I never forget in my life and okay. quiz and all other stuff. So amazing to really I'm exciting very much today and emotionally really I'm the great day for me to host Dr. Basu. So he's a, he was a professor, he's a professor and head of the department. He just, uh, his headship is over in the first July onwards, Department of Pathology, Jipmar Pondicherry. 
core faculty member, Department of Medical Education, Jipma Pondicherry, former head, Department of Transfusion Medicine, Jipma Pondicherry. He joined Jipma Pondicherry as assistant professor in 1995. Dr. Basu is earlier actually senior research, research associate in the pool officer under CSIR at GB Panth Hospital, New Delhi. He graduated post graduation from Medical College, New Delhi in 1985 and 1990, respectively. He's a hardcore Delhi guy and then shifted to Pondicherry. He was awarded the MR Parthasarathy and AV Ramaprasad oration at the 41st Annual Conference of Karnataka Chapter of Indian Association of Pathologists and Microbiologists held at Bangalore in 2014. He was also awarded BD Badua oration at Northeast Annual Pathology Conference under the aegis of Indian Association of Pathologists and Microbiologists held at Silong in September 2013. He has over 200 peer-reviewed publications in reputed national and international journals through his name. His interest are in the field of hematopathology, of bone marrow, and lymphoma and leukemia. He is also keenly interested in medical education. And now I will introduce our special guest today. Dr. Kirit G. Naik, he's MD, FRC Path, Consultant Pathologist, Abha Clinical Laboratory in Surat, Gujarat. He, is, he, done, he did his MRC Path London from Royal College of Pathologist, FRC Path from Royal College of Pathologist London, and he has worked as Assistant Professor, Government Medical College, Surat, 1970. Subsequently, he was Associate Professor in Surgical Pathology at University Teaching Hospital, Lusaka, Zambia, Africa, 1971-1980. He was Head, Department of Pathology, Microbiology at MTA, Zambia from 1978 to 1980. He has published 25 peer-reviewed papers in the reputed national and international journals, all during the tenure in Zambia. So I invite Dr. Kirit to inaugurate and please share some word of wisdom to our students and our faculties. Dr. Thank Kirit, you. Please. Thank you. I thank Dr. M.B. Agrawal and the organizer of Mumbai Hematology Group for inviting me to inaugurate today's live webinar on peripheral blood smear examination in the today's world of automation, which is going to be addressed by eminent experienced pathologist, Dr. Basu. During my past 50 years of practice, I have witnessed continuous expansion of various laboratory tests and treatment protocol in hematology, oncology, and blood transmission services. Manual tests. I have witnessed the manual tests to automation from one part to seven part cell, blood cell counter, cytogenetic to molecular testing, NGS to artificial engineering. Similarly, the treatment protocol from simple ion therapy to blood transmission, chemotherapy to immunotherapy, target therapy to bone marrow transplantation. I have seen all these things during my career, which include my experience at abroad as well as here. However, one warrior, one warrior on the glass slide called PS examination has impressed me the most. The PS and CBC is the initial test in any hematology workup. And it is the most important test, like a first step in our life. And if your first step is right, then your life is smooth. Similarly, these first steps is a life-saving and most important test in hematologist workup. And if you begin well with that, then you achieve everything for the diagnosis and treatment. It dissects neoplastic versus non-neoplastic, benign versus malignant, infectious versus non-infectious, and it also checks counter-check the automation results, automated self-counter results indirectly. And I feel it is the most important, you always check the peripheral smear first and then see your auto-analyzer result. 
then you will find out what is going on on both sides of the coin. Also, this is the most important test which is well prepared smear and stain smear give lot of information from which you can proceed onwards for the diagnosis and treatment of a particular patient. I can give you some example. For example, if you see a peripheral smear, it gives you a morphology, it gives you a parasite, it gives you so many things. But if you use it properly, you can get a lot of information. I give you one of my experience in Gujarat in the malaria day endemic area. So if you have a smear and if there are atypical lymphocytes on the second day of a fever, always think about malaria. If you have an atypical smear with low platelet, it points to malaria. Similarly, on fifth day, if you are smear showing atypical smear and low platelet, it points to a dengue. Lot of people come for routine checkup in the morning like lipid profile, CBC, blood sugar. And during that time, I have observed that if your cholesterol is too low, then you examine the smear for malaria parasite. And invariably, in the evening, the patient will say, I have fever. So it gives an indirect evidence of malaria by observing a simple parameter like low cholesterol in routine checkup. Secondly, hypersegmented neutrophil even one or two, and if it had more than five lobe, you have a lot of, you differentiate from iron deficiency to macrocytic amenia and so on. Even the examining the simple slide, whether it's a thick or a very thin, you can find out whether he's anemic. If it is a thick slide, it increase, increase globulin, increase red cell mass like polycythemium, especially the thick slide or cryoglobulin and so on. So I think the peripheral smear examination gives a lot of information from one, 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 like basophilic stippling, if you see, you can suspect late poisoning or thalassemia and other anemia. I feel a clever pathologist observe during his career various parts and apply this, his knowledge to the individual finding to correlate with the clinical data. And I have seen so many diagnoses during my career by simple examination of peripheral smear. One of the most important things that in our country during the fever or rainy season, we should use thin smear as well as thick smear because the thick smear is a gold standard for diagnosis of the malarial parasite. So in, and in today's era of high-end technology, please use these powerful tests as engine for your clinical Ferrari car. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kirit, for your nice uh, uh, short advices to our students and the faculty. Uh, Dr. Basu, now you please start, share your screen, and now everything is yours. I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah, is it visible? Yes. All right, shall I start then? Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's almost going to be good afternoon uh, to all of you out there. And just as Dr. Sanyal, I, I'll call him Shubha Prasad, uh, as always, Shubha, uh, just as he said he's feeling excited, I am also feeling excited and the reason for that is I have, I'm in a unique position of having my teacher, Dr. Tejinder Singh, sitting across and my student, Dr. Sanyal, who's uh, there. So uh, in a kind of an enviable as well as a very humbling moment for me, as I take on this uh, topic of in today's world of automation, there is still a lot to learn from peripheral blood smear examination. And as, I, as, I, as I'm talking to all of you, I'm going back almost to 1986, 1987, 88 when I entered the Department of Pathology at Maulana Azad Medical College, which has made me what I am today. And this vividly remember all the slides, all the uh, morning sessions with Dr. Tejinder Singh and Dr. Sudharani, Dr. Shom, and all my teachers out there. 
who taught me the basics of hematology. And this uh, next about half an hour to 40 minutes that I'm going to talk on is actually directed to the uh, junior pathologists, the ones who are beginning their career in pathology and extolling them the importance of a simple observation on the peripheral blood, not to take away the, the wonderful uh, information, the aspects of automation and the cell counters. All right, so let's start the session with one uh, photograph, which I want you to uh, understand, see, and think about what it is. I'm sure if it were a you know, physical uh, presentation, I'm sure I would have asked you uh, what it is, but think about the answer. This and this, the two pictures on the screen, just is going to be a part of the entire essence of my talk today. The first picture is actually in 1845, the first description by John Hughes Bennett of a morphological diagnosis of leukemia. It was published as a case of hypertrophy of the spleen and liver in which death took place from suppuration of the uh, blood. You can see for yourself, wait, just let me get the pointer out. Yeah, you can see for yourself in this panel uh, is the fresh blood. You see the RBCs and the WBCs. And this after the next one is after the addition of uh, acetic acid. And here you notice the entire spectrum of myeloid cells that is visible. You know, looking at this picture gives me kind of a goosebump. Imagine about almost 200 years ago, there was someone looking under the microscope and diagnosing based on morphology. The other picture is, you must have guessed it right, the, the, the patent that both these gentlemen, Wallace Coulter and his brother, Joseph Coulter, it was the patent that they had applied for, uh, for the production of their first, uh, this is the first uh, cell counter, the Coulter counter that came out in 1956. And this statement is very interesting. When they initially applied for the patent, they actually applied for patenting a orifice, a small hole through which they wanted the blood to flow through and the cells to be in a single line against an electric grain. And it was rejected. The statement that was given to them by the uh, patent attorneys was, you can't patent a hole. They tried, and also interestingly, all along all these years, you know, till the day before yesterday, I thought there was just this one Wallace Coulter who was responsible for the cell counting that we know today, but it was actually, he was aided by his younger brother, Joseph Coulter, and together they have revolutionized the uh, world of uh, hematology. So with the advances in automation in blood cell analyzers, the number of blood samples that need peripheral blood smear has decreased over the years. 30 years back when I was doing my PG, all the samples, all the specimens that came to the lab, a peripheral smear was made and diligently we had to go through. I think that that gave us the impetus of learning about the peripheral blood. But yes, now with advances in the cell counters, the greater number of patient load, increasing amount of investigations, of course, the number of samples that need peripheral smear examination has decreased. And today's talk would discuss the need to decrease as well as why it has decreased. And in spite of the fact that it has decreased, how to make the best advantage of the peripheral blood. The sophisticated cell counters, they just not provide the counts. They provide counts and in the indices. They provide differentials, scatter plots, histograms, cytomorphometry, all of which aid in diagnostics with a much shorter turnaround time and less consumption of human resources. So these are the big advantages that we have of the cell counters. So there is this entire tussle between the man and the machine. You know, that's always there uh, throughout uh, our lives. We are facing this. Instead of having a fight, let's, let's join hands together and get to an optimal diagnosis. So blood smear is a crucial diagnostic aid. The man and machine are complementary to each other. Blood smear examination currently validates the automated counts. It cannot replace it. It doesn't, uh, we are in an era where we need the automated counts and the blood smears to validate it. Just like human beings are not immune to deception, we make mistakes. The machines also do make errors and how much morphology can cell counters do? So these are the two questions that I'll try and answer and see whether what is the role of uh, a blood smear examination in current practice. Now, what are the indications of doing a blood smear examination? The indications could be initiated by the clinician or by the laboratory, right? We'll go into the details, but it also depends on the stage of learning that you are in. For those at the initial stages, your first year posting, your initial days of uh, hematopathology, looking at all the slides are your indication. The indication of uh, 
wanting to see a slide is wanting to learn what the cells look like. So what are the clinical indi indications? The clinician generated requests, we get that in plenty. And this, the, the, the table that I'm gonna show is adapted from Dr. Barbara Bain's uh, wonderful article on diagnosis from the blood smear. I've added on my inputs and I'm sure this list is not uh, complete. There will be many other indications which I'm sure we can discuss it out later. So some of the indications mm, uh, that could result in a peripheral smear examination from a clinician is anemia and or jaundice which is unexplained and raising doubts of hemolytic anemia and the peripheral smear is wanted. Severe or refractory anemia with or without cytopenias, another indication. When there is a clinical suspicion of sickle cell in the form of jaundice, limb, chest, abdominal pain, especially in children. Then petechia or other mucocutaneous bleeds, suggestive of thrombocytopenia and want to know the causes for that. Unexplained or severe infections or fever suggesting neutropenia. Lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, mediastinal mass on radiology, which suggests the lymphoproliferative disorder. The myeloproliferative disorder, splenomegaly, cyanosis, itching, bone pain, weight loss. Features of disseminated intravascular coagulation of thrombotic microangiopathy. Again, peripheral smear is often uh, asked for. Recent onset renal failure, particularly in a child. Suspicion of infections with hemoparasites, such as malaria or filariasis. Now, all these are there. There could be many more, which we can discuss out. What about lab generated? Yes, the first and foremost is when the counter gives you abnormal counts. We always look at the counter values and then do a peripheral smear. So, and for this, we need to have certain consensus criteria. Individual labs follow different criteria depending on the patient population, the type of analysis you have. There's a very good uh, uh, lead on the basic consensus criteria in this article in laboratory hematology in 2005. Some of the parameters that could be, you know, if you have a case with a low MCV or a very high MCV, RDW high, low platelets, high platelets, the first sample in a neonate, the counter doesn't give you a WBC differential properly. Any of these parameters need to be looked at. So that's one, one aspect. The second aspect is when the analyzer gives you flags. So for instance, if you look at it, the flags over here. Sorry. This, this is the area of the flags. So if you get any kind of flagging over here, look at it carefully and go and make a smear. However, as I said, it is important for those of us who are straining and all of us to master the art of peripheral smear examination. Every case normal to abnormal. So you should know your peripheral smear well enough so that you can hand over the role of the peripheral smear examination to the computers. You know, unless you know what is there in the peripheral smear, you will never be confident about saying that in future, that the computer or artificial intelligence is going to take over. If it has to take over, you should know your peripheral blood very well. And it's always, always true if you correlate the clinical history, which many a times may not be very much available, but you have to be persistent, correlated with the automated CBC and the histograms and the, the values that it is giving, and your peripheral blood smear, it usually helps in almost all your cases. So that's, that's the power of combining the two uh, information correctly. These are some of the articles. I'll share it with you where, where you can learn about how to interpret the peripheral blood smears. These are some of our work that we have done over the past few years, which have uh, validated kind of the role of peripheral blood and the uh, scatter plots and the uh, automated cell analyzer. And, uh, and this has led to a recent editorial that I published in our uh, internal journal. Similar topic is, are we getting redundant in peripheral smear examination? The overview of my talk would be for purely convenience sake, interpretation of RBCs, WBCs, platelets, looking for parasites, and every step the cell counter values will be taken into account. Now, this is entirely for convenience sake. Mind you, there'll be places where one interpretation of RBCs and the platelets would go simultaneously. So let's work with a drop of blood, what wonders we can do. Okay, by the way, just for uh, breaking the monotony, did you hear about the RBCs, WBCs, and the platelets? Well, they all made a marrow escape, right? So let's start with the RBCs. And the first, again, not necessarily the most important, but the first uh, finding. Now let us see what are we seeing in this case. You have a patient with a hemoglobin of six, hematocrit 22, the MCV, MCH, MCHC, all microcytic hypochromic, the platelets are adequate, the RDWCV is 30, and you have a microcytic RBCs. Now this, is microcytic 
and RVCs. Now, suppose you have this and you know the flag the machine has given you are in Divisional Senior. You would do a peripheral smear, you would still do out of practice and look whether it's corroborating. And if your indices were slightly different, let's say your RBC count was 6 million in this particular case, your hemoglobin was 10, RBC was 6 million, and your RDW was about 13 or 14, your entire approach would change. So that is the importance in your cell counter interpretation. If you had a similar finding, but hemoglobin 10 with an RBC high and a RDW low, your diagnosis would shift to possibly you're dealing with a thalassemia trait. In that situation, you would straight away looking at this, you would, your mind would be set, let's go ahead and investigate for, get an HPLC done or something else. But if you were to look at a smear for an iron deficiency, it'll corroborate you. You see the typical microcytosis. You know, we teach our undergraduates uh, less than the size of the nucleus of a lymphocyte. It conforms. You see the elongated or the pencil cells that we have. You see a stray here and there, a target cell. So you know that this is a typical appearance of a microcytic hypochromic, and this is what is there in your mind. Similarly, with microcytic hypochromic indices, if you had a smear like this, your direction would change slightly. You see the anisopoikulocytosis, you see the uh, elongation, you see the target cells, you see the NRVCs, you see the breakage. Now, this, you know, is not likely to be an iron deficiency. This is something that is going to be beyond maybe a hemoglobinopathy, thalassemia, and that is what you will think. Look at the clinical features and go ahead and investigate. You can get a lot of information from this smear itself. This is one case that uh, I keep harping on and that I had seen way back in uh, when I was a postgraduate student. This was a 22 year old uh, uh, nursing student who had chronic anemia, was being treated for iron therapy. And this was the field. You, you, now that with experience, you know that this is possibly not just iron deficiencies. Look at the number of target cells that we have. And that time we did a reticulocyte count. So again, morphology. Look at the reticulocyte count, you find the golf ball inclusions and you make a diagnosis of possibly alpha thalassemia and go ahead and investigate. That's the power of uh, looking at the morphology. What about this case? Now, this was a case that came to us. We reported it out as hemoglobin 10 grams and CB was 79. The clinician called up a few, few uh, hours later and said that, hey, three days ago, you had given a hemoglobin of six or seven. Now we've got a hemoglobin of 10, what's going on? You make a smear, look at it, and you find what is going on. You tell the clinician, look, boss, you probably have transfused the patient. You probably have transfused the patient. And there are these uh, transfused RBCs you can make out. Transfused RBC. So this is the information that you're giving, looking at the peripheral blood smear. Uh, in a case where the, the hemoglobin was, according to them, this All right. So then if you look at it, if you look at it, at this point of time, if you see the histogram, the histogram is going to help you say that hey, there are these two peaks that are used. What about this? To the juniors, to the first, someone, if you've seen your smears well, you would know that this is nothing but the water artifacts that are a part of it. There are certain new parameters on the uh, cell counters. Now, we'll discuss this later on, maybe, which tell you that there is iron deficient erythropoiesis, reticulated the hemoglobin, percentage of hypochromic cells, percentage of microcytic or microcytic anemia factors. These are available, but in select brands of uh, cell counters. Not all the cell counters are able to give you this. So that's another little problem we have when we talk of automation. The, each of the cell counters have different uh, parameters, apart from the basic ones, which, which give us indication to the different things. So now coming from a background where you have a lab, you're in a medical college or, uh, you know, you have one system in your college, you know, like, for instance, where, where, whether we are still uh, INI and Institute of National Importance, but still we go by L1. So we have only one system in this section. So we have to base our uh, entire approach on whatever parameters are being given by that system. There are numerous new parameters that have come up, each of them very useful, but to get a hand of experience of all of these becomes difficult for an individual. You have immature reticulocyte fractions, which tells us about the bone marrow responses. Okay, so next talk of the macrocytic group. 
When MCV is high, how do we deal with it? So when you have a case with a macrocytic index, here we have an MCV of 111, you see the shift to right in the Hughes histogram, you know it's macrocytic. The first thing that I would like to do is to, apart from the clinical history, look at the smear. Here I would look at the smear and if it's a true macrocyte, I know what my diagnosis is, which, which area I'll go in. At times, polychromasia in a field may give an MCV to be high. Yes, uh, that, that is when you need to confirm it. Is it because of megaloblastic or macrocytes, true macrocytes, or is it a polychromatic response? As Dr. Kirit uh, talked about, you see hypersegmented neutrophils, you see oval macrocytes, your diagnosis is made. Uh, you could ask for uh, vitamin B12 or folate assays. Many a times it's not uh, uh, available to most of the people. They may be costly. Looking at this smear, you could start your treatment stat. A macrocytic index, which looks like this with very, very abnormal. Oh, sorry. With very abnormal uh, MCH and MCHC. You know what it is. The histogram has a big tail towards the right. You expect uh, clumping and uh, agglutination. So this is the typical graph that comes when you have an agglutinated uh, red cells. This, the same case, but once you have uh, put it into an incubator, brought down the temp brought up the temperature, you can uh, get a normal uh, count. However, this, this came some days back. There was definite agglutination but the cell counter somehow for some reason, the RBC histogram did not reflect. So at times uh, you may get a discrepancy. It's good to have a look at the peripheral smear. This was a case, 26 year pregnant lady. If you just look at the indices without looking at the histogram, you would be tempted to call it normocytic normochromic. Notice there are these nice uh, hypochromic cells as well as normocytic, some macrocytic cells. So this is a typical dimorphic and you would expect a uh, double peak or at least a widened uh, RDW in such situations. So it's always again good to not just look at the indices, look at the histogram, look at the peripheral smear and get your diagnosis right. 65 year male osteolytic lesions in the skull suspected myeloma and you have this rule formation that tells you that, okay, we are dealing with a case of plasma cell myeloma. At times, the history is not, it's just like a renal failure. You know that myeloma patients often present with renal failure. And you see rule formation, make a search and you would find uh, circulating plasma cells. So your diagnosis is, you're on the way to your diagnosis. The poikilocytes have a story of their own. You know, most of the cell counters, the parameters that are readily available, don't talk much of poikilocytes or don't, cannot really. Of course, we have currently fragmented red cell indices, schistocytes, on the uh, cellar vision, we, we are getting a lot of uh, information, but uh, nothing probably here in this group beats a peripheral smear examination. This is what I've taken from the ASH bank, uh, bank a classical case of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and the histogram that shows. Notice the platelets. Here are the platelets, typically uh, with the upper discriminator gone because of the fragmentation and the widened RDW and the hump in the lower discriminator of the RBCs. Okay, and you see these smears. So this is something that I would urge all of us to be able to identify looking at the peripheral smear. The initial for the first diagnostic sample should be with a peripheral smear. Any, it could be a cause of anemia, it could be a jaundice, it could be bleeding. Please, please identify fragmented cells and schistocytes. And there are beautiful articles and more than 1% of schistocytes, it's a medical emergency. You need to identify them. And it's very important there are various types of fragmented RBC. So just get a hang of it. The keratocytes, the classical helmet cell, the triangular schistocytes. You also get a lot of microspherocytes in uh, microangiopathic hemolytic anemias. All these are a part of the spectrum of thrombotic microangiopathy, and it's a finding of ominous significance. You've got to grade it. Even 1% has to be reported out. It's important to note that how, 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 do you, how confident are you of your diagnosis of my, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia? There should be thrombocytopenia of features of NRBCs and polychromatic cells. And the main morphological change is a schistocyte. That's microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Uh, okay, so the predominant population is schistocytes in a background. That's, that's microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Another case where peripheral smear helps. A 23-year-old girl, 
ingestion of insecticides severely jaundiced. And what do you see? You see these pointed at the arrows, the typical bite cells. Again, bite cells are something that can be picked up. You have this case, you have bites and blisters. You notice the, the, the RBC membrane just hanging around and more than 4%. Here, we at times do a count, but again, if you see so many of them, you know that you're dealing with a bite cell anemia, you report it out. And what do you do next? You do the reticulocyte. That's a useful investigation. And what next? You do the Heinz body preparation. Again, morphologically, you're able to pick up the diagnosis. Now, it's important. It's, it's commonly seen with G6PD deficiency, many oxidant drugs, Dapson is one, Rasputicase is now another one, which we are using for tumor lysis syndrome. Uh, all malaria, anti-malarials, you generally investigate for G6PD before you give these drugs, the known ones. But there could be many unknown situations where you can land up uh, with a patient of uh, bite cell anemia. Chronic liver disease, Wilson's disease, and post lectomy also you might get some of the RBCs which show a bite, which show a kind of a distorted, irregular contractions. Uh, be careful about that. Now, it's important to diagnose bite cell anemia on the peripheral blood because, as you know, the G6PD assays are available, but not too many, and they will take time. And at the time of acute hemolysis, when there is reticulocytosis, you can get a falsely elevated G6PD. So that's important. At diagnosis, peripheral smear and Heinz bodies is what is diagnostic. Let the episode of hemolysis get over and then you do your G6PD assay. It's important that uh, I've added this slide uh, knowing that G6PD deficiency or bite cell anemia can be very subtle. The history may not always be available of a drug. Whole lot of chemicals, drugs, things that we use in routine day-to-day -day life can cause uh, bite cells in a patient who is G6PD deficiency. Okay, naphthalene. I remember Dr. Sukesh telling us a story sometime back of a child presenting with bite cell anemia and they couldn't find a cause, excepting that they, not, they, they learned from the parent that he was wearing uh, the sweaters or the woolens of his brother, which were kept in a trunk uh, for many months. And the trunk had mothballs you know, for, as an insect repellent. And that landed up. I was also surprised that things like henna, green tea extracts, uh, bit, bitter gourd, etc., have been reported with, uh, with uh, following bite cell anemia. Okay, now what is this? Another finding on the peripheral smear, spherocytes, right? Are they artifactual or are they actual? One little clue that I have learned is if it is a true spherocyte, you don't find the uh, rulaying formation that we see even in the body or the head end of a smear. Spherocytes tend to repel each other. That's a feature, uniform size spherocytes can be seen with a mild to moderate reticulocyte. We'll always do a Coombs test and that is hereditary spherocytosis for you. In autoimmune hemolytic anemia, the other cause of spherocytic anemia, the retics are usually high. It's a warm antibody type, DCT is positive. And this is again one finding that I uh, often see. That is WBCs with a kind of rosetted by RBCs in a peripheral smear of hemolytic anemia, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. You see spherocytes in children, newborn, with uh, blood group incompatibility, both ABO and RH. So much of NRVCs and all is likely to be an RH incompatibility. You don't need any other investigation when you have this uh, on the peripheral smear. That's all. You know you're dealing with a hereditary elliptocytosis. This is again a very interesting uh, uh, presentation that we had. We had one of our senior professors whose uh, daughter was getting married, and uh, his sisters and brothers came over to attend the wedding. They were from Kashmir. They came over to attend the wedding. Uh, and as usual, when you have uh, family members coming to visit you, you take them to the lab to get a routine investigation. And we diagnosed this in one of the uh, sisters of our professor. And soon we realized that the entire family, once we diagnosed it in one, the entire, they're all elderly ladies and gents. We, the entire family, brothers and sisters, had uh, hereditary leptocytosis and they didn't know about it for the rest of their lives anyway. Okay. This is again something that is picked up on the peripheral blood, you know that, why this girl has jaundice or why she presented with chest pain, abdominal pain, hemoptysis, hematuria, whatever, or uh, strokes. When you see sickle cell in the peripheral blood, you, you can pick it up immediately. What other information does this give you? Can you tell me? Look at this cell. Look at this cell. 
these are Hubble jolly bodies. So when you see Hubble jolly bodies in a background of sickle cell with so many target cells, it is a functional hyposplenia. So this patient has got splenic infarcts. Okay, can you tell juniors, what is this RBC showing? That's a platelet sitting on an RBC. Okay, so at times it could be confusing, but be careful. Howell Jolly body is an important indicator. So this is, again, a typical uh, scenario that we get. Many a times, peripheral smear specifically asked for post splenectomy. And you notice the acanthocytes, you notice the, egg, uh, the Howell Jolly bodies, you notice the target cells, you notice the thrombocytosis, and this is a marker for that the patient has had a successful splenectomy. So post splenectomy, you get all these findings. So Howell Jolly bodies are important things to note in the peripheral smear. They, one, they tell you about post splenectomy status. You might get Howell Jolly body as a part of megaloblastic anemia and the erythropoiesis in, in MDS, et cetera. And it is important finding to pick up in post splenectomy refractory ITP or AIH. Okay, so that's another uh, little uh, thing that always gives you a clue. Suppose you did not find Howell Jolly bodies in a sample post splenectomy. Go back to the clinician and say, maybe a splenunculus was left behind. Is that the possibility? So that, that's an important clue to the uh, functional uh, hyposplenism that happens. A young boy from Punjab, recurrent jaundice splenomegaly, and you know you're dealing with a hemoglobinopathy by looking at the target cells. Target cells are kind of nonspecific. They are seen in a wide variety of conditions, so you have to always correlate the clinical scenario with that. So they can be seen in, let's say, uh, this is a uh, thalassemic. That's a sickle on the right. That's here is a typical crystals of hemoglobin C. We don't get to see it. I have not seen a single case of hemoglobin C so far. And that's a case of post -penectomy. So target cells are uh, ubiquitously seen in a wide variety of conditions, but can be giving you a clue to uh, various disorders. So these are a wide variety. One important point of uh, target cell is that uh, they are often an artifact of blood smear preparation due to either slow air drying or over anticoagulation. So this can be seen in the peripheral blood very regularly. Uh, don't always uh, learn to appreciate it as an artifact also. This was a case with a recurrent jaundice, splenomegaly, hemoglobin 7, and retic 6. Now this, looking at this smear, uh, you would want to throw it into the dustbin. You would uh, probably make a noise, tell your technician, hey, you don't know how to make a smear. At times it happens. Storage, blood, and all it happens. But then with this history of recurrent jaundice, you do pay attention or high retic count. And we happen to, uh, instead of throwing it straight, we happen to put it under oil and we picked up the stippled RBCs. Okay, so this was a case where even a bad made, badly made smear gives you a clue to the diagnosis and you go ahead and investigate. And you have this beautiful stipples in the RBCs of pyrimidine 5 nucleotidase deficiency. It also, mind you, remain, uh, can be seen in lead poisoning, can be seen as a part of uh, dyserythropoiesis, but it is a useful uh, clue to pick up on the smear. Okay, when you look at a smear like this, look at a smear like this. I mean, when we were students, we were grilled about cremation, the birth cell and the spur cell. I feel like now they are they are good good things to notice, but their clinical relevance has kind of come down. Like no one uses a spur on a boot anymore. Uh, there is some, but yet they are they are giving you clues to a particular diagnosis. Echinocytes or birth cells are useful for picking. I mean, cases of renal failure, uremia, liver disease, etc. It is also the commonest storage artifact. Very very clear about that. Acanthocytes are important in two situations. Yes. It's again a finding of hyposplenism or asplenia. It's seen in A-beta lipoproteinemia and also in a disease called neuroacanthocytosis. So this is one indication where we look at the peripheral smear for acanthocytes when your neurologist sends you the samples. Are these acanthocytes or echinocytes or what? No, these are storage artifacts. Okay, this is not a, this is a slide that has been made maybe many hours after the sample has been collected. In the RBCs, this is again a 78-year male, massive spleen. Now, what are we seeing here? Look carefully. And you will find tear dropping right here and there. NRBCs, occasional blast. Now, you know you're dealing with a myelophysic anemia. And you go ahead and investigate. And this patient had myelofibrosis. So that's the power of the smear. So tear dropping can be seen, and this was a case of metastatic adenocarcinoma. This was a case of metastatic neuroblastoma. 
So this is an important finding of teardrop cells and leukoblastic blood picture, two common conditions where they are encountered is metastasis and myelofibrosis. So what do we learn from the RBCs? The type of anemia, particularly the hemolytic group, macrocytic group, the various poikilocytes tell you their stories and the red cell inclusions. Let's move on to the WBCs for a while. They add color, as we know, to the peripheral blood. And there are, again, lots of newer parameters that are available, apart from the counts and differentials. You know, currently, the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio has come up in a big way. And it is being done in so many diseases. And with COVID, we got good results. There are these uh, volume conduction scatter, uh, various uh, cell counters giving you granularity index, the large unstained cell population, hemoparasites being picked up. It's a good tool for screening of sepsis and bacterial infections. The cell population data that you get, the scatter plots, have been tried out in viral infections and CLPD. That apart, for most of us, we look at the counts, we look at the scatter plots, and we, we try and look at the peripheral smear to see if the clues match. Most cell counters do give us a nucleated red cell count nowadays, but some of the older ones did not. And we had to make a correction for the presence of NRBCs if there were more than 10 in the peripheral blood you look for. So that's another important tool that you have. Look at the peripheral smear. If there are too many NRBCs, correct the neutrophil, the total leukocyte count and send it back. Okay. Information, you would say that it's all right. I don't think cell counters can talk about the gender right now. But the bar body tells you that you're dealing with a sample from a female patient. Neutrophilia, if you know your normal uh, scatter plots, you will be able to identify that these are all instances of neutrophilic leukocytosis with a, a kind of a, a higher uh, site scatter and uh, possibly the reflecting the uh, shift to left and the toxic granules. This is an important uh, finding on the peripheral blood. The spectrum of toxic changes. Mind you, you have neutrophilic leukocytosis, right? You have typical toxic changes. You have the dole bodies. You have apoptosis and you have frayed margins and cytoplasmic vacuolation. All these spectrum together is what is called the toxic change. And these are nothing but the myeloid cells are being pushed out into the peripheral blood before the granules actually get time to get packed properly. It's part of the shift that happens when the marrow is irritated when there is an infection. It's a good sign for uh, bacterial infection, yes. A similar change may be seen in patients on filgrastinos GCSF. Be careful about that. Not just these coarse granules, you might even pick up blasts. So wait for a while or ask the clinician, has the patient been on GCSF? You know, this, this scenario occurs when you are dealing with post-chemotherapy samples. Okay, so please ask your clinicians, has the patient been receiving GCSF? If you are spotting blasts in the peripheral blood, Wait a while, let the three, four days pass, let this group of neutrophils get out of the peripheral blood, and then uh, you can see it again. Again, eight-year-old child with recurrent chest infection, you have your diagnosis made when you look at this peripheral blood. Right, Chedia Figashi, typical uh, violaceous brownish granules. This was a smear in a jaundice tumor, and I put this up because this is the only example, only time when I have been able to feature in the British Journal of Hematology Images page. This was a trivia maybe, but did give us good information about neonatal hyperbilirubinemia, presence of neutrophil crystals. And this we found is more seen in the sepsis group of uh, neonatal hyperbilirubinemia than in the hemolytic uh, type of hyperbilirubinemia that we get. So far till date, I have seen this only in one adult and that to in a patient of high jaundice in an obstructive jaundice case. But it was a good finding that we had. And Whenever there is lymphocytosis, again, learn to appreciate the scatter plots. The pink ones are the lymphocytes. So appreciate and you find it. And at times in your lymphocytes, you might be able to pick up uh, the diagnosis. The vacuoles in the lymphocytes, the vacuoles in the neutrophils, 11-month-old child, delayed milestones, hepatosplenomegaly. What are you looking for? Storage cells. Do a marrow and confirm your diagnosis of whatever be the storage cells. It's often seen in the peripheral blood as vacuoles. In acute febrile illness, yes, this is a regularly where we make smears and also look at the interpretation. And you have the typical appearance of that J-shaped uh, thing in viral infections. You get that very often. And if you have a history with reactive lymphocytes, you know you're dealing with infectious mononucleosis or other viral infections. And blasts. Again, important to look and appreciate the blasts 
because that paves your way for rationalizing your further immunophenotyping or whatever you want to do. The cell counters, the scatter plots are telling you that they're all abnormal. They will not be very specific for AML or ALL, it's difficult, but all looking at the scatter plots, you know that you're dealing with a, uh, some abnormality in the peripheral blood. And or rods, yes, without a shade of doubt, that's pathognomonic of myeloid lineage. And you know where you are standing when you're looking at these. Okay. Emergency smears, again, another uh, sample which, or another disease which I install all my residents to identify uh, whatever be the time of the day, howsoever tired you are, and that is uh, in situations where you see atypical promyelocytes, M AML, M3, the faggot cells may or may not be there. You might get a, hypogr a hypogranular type of AML, but learn to appreciate it. It paves way for an immediate diagnosis. Immediate management can be started. ATRA can be started overnight, and you can uh, kind of save the patient from various complications. It permits a very rapid provisional diagnosis. It's important to pick up promyelocytes. Case of ALL, and you have this typical deep blue cytoplasm with vacuoles, and you know you're dealing with a Burkitt leukemia. All right, so that, that's uh, another morphological thing. You have this typical flower-shaped nucleus, and you know you're dealing with an uh, adult T-cell lymphoma leukemia or Cesare syndrome. Each of them have various morphological clues that give you the first step to your diagnosis. If you have a 54-year-old male with splenomegaly and 97,000 count, extremely bad-looking uh, Scatter plots, uh, the, the scattergrams are gray and high, huge. You know they're dealing with a CML case, okay? So CML, is it, it's important to, at the baseline, follow up, remission, look for blasts, look for basophils, and your diagnosis of CML is done on a peripheral smear. Again, for see other types of tonic leukemias, there is this distinct abnormalities that you can find. And this is a patient with a 60-year male generalized lymphadenopathy. You have lymphocytosis, right? Two years later, again, you look at a smear. The cell counters will not give you much information. And you look for pro-lymphocytes. You look for development of pro-lymphocytic transformation. And you have these uh, prominent nucleolus that, that uh, gives you a clue that this patient is transforming. Patient of CLL, something like fragment or a degeneration is also an important clue. You know, uh, the smudge cells, you know, there have been articles which say the percentage of smudge cells on routine predicts survival. Patients with a higher number of smudge cells have a, a good prognosis than with lower number of smudge cells. Can you tell me what this patient has? It's again a case of CLL. Now look at the RBCs and you find there are lots of spherocytes. You know you this patient, in addition to his CLL, has an autoimmune hemolytic anemia component, which, which causes complications in his management and therapy. The small, the chronic lymphoproliferative disorders also, they kind of look alike, but there are quite a few subtle, if not subtle changes in the lymphoid population. The one on the left has that typical biphenotypic, uh, bi bipolar uh, uh, extrusions like that of an SLVL. Here you have this deep indented indentation in the nucleus, spitting a follicular lymphoma, and you have the circumferential hairy cell. So each of these give you clues to what your diagnosis is going to be. Morphology, now we know, this is again a very pet question or a pet slide in the quizzes. The cup-shaped nucleus, uh, uh, nucleus that is there associated with the NPM1 uh, thing was first described in 2005. So morphology does give you a clue to a whole lot of not just disease, but also the molecular aspects of it. Elderly male, pancytopenia, and you find a blast. You know you're dealing with either a subleukemic or a, a MDS. Look again carefully, and you find Pelgerhu anomaly, and that again paves your way for a diagnosis. If morphology wasn't there, this front page of blood wouldn't have been possible. These are apparently all neutrophils from patients with myelodysplastic syndrome. So from the WBCs, what do we identify? We check the counts. Check the diff and modify if necessary for shift cells or monocytes. But currently, the I feel the ordinated diff, differential count is perfect. You don't really have to uh, change it or look at it. Take that as the true differential that happens. Toxic and other reactive changes, leukemia, lymphomas, and dysmylophoresis. Let's go on to the platelets, the final part of it. And this is where the most of the contentious 
things are there. It's a rough guide. On the peripheral blood, you cannot really do a count. You can estimate. It's a valuable check on the count of values. As you all know, you learned it. One platelet per loyal immersion is approximately 10,000. You need to have an even distribution of platelets in the smear. And even a clump, a good clump of 8 to 10 platelets will tell you that this is adequate. Let's take up some real-life instances that happened with platelets and uh, uh, the peripheral blood, how it played a role. This was a routine uh, PS that was done, and the resident there that did not do the counts were not done, just the PS was sent. The residents frantically was looking for platelets, said this is thrombocytopenia, asked them to send a sample and put it up on the cell counter, and it was perfectly all right. Platelet count of about four lakhs. He was wondering what to do when his senior came up and said, hey, look at the edges of the smear. And all the platelets were clumped at the edges and the tail of the smear. So that's one little caveat or little thing, tip to, to the juniors, that if you're not finding platelets in the body, look at the tail and edge. That's where they are often present. This was a five-year-old boy. Again, another of a case that came in the middle of the night one day. And my resident called me up and said, uh, Chitra, you, if you are there, maybe listening to it, you would remember you called me up at 10 p.m. in the night and said, not even much later, said, I think we are dealing with a, we've got a case of trypanosomes. And this was what the smears that was there. There were these, uh, platelet count was normal, TLC was high, uh, hemoglobin, and these cells were there. These, these things were there. We even looked up how trypanosomes look, and these were all from the internet. And they were all activated platelets. Okay, platelet activation, prolonged storage. They were not trypanosomes. Platelets can be very tricky. They can, you can have various forms, including this one on the left. Sorry, this one. That was there in the net, very similar to the platelet that we had got. So be careful of platelet artifacts when you're looking at a smear. A 14-year-old girl had come to us with menorrhage complaint and there was this little doubt whether it's a functional disorder or a puberty menorrhagia. We received EDTA samples and the platelet count was normal and this is what the samples smear showed, scattering of platelets. What do you do in such situations? When you get an EDTA sample, it's always good to get a finger prick, direct smear. You know, it's, it's always good to make a direct smear or ask the resident, please send us a finger prick smear, we will decide. So if your finger prick smear is showing scattered platelets, still look for platelet function defect. But if your finger prick smear is showing good clumps, it's possibly a puberty menorrhagia that you're dealing with, check out with the gynecologist. So when you are asking for uh, platelet function disorders, make a direct smear and have a look at it. This is again something that we commonly get, a 30-year-old menorrhagia, repeated counts of 30 to 45,000. Our lab count was 49,000. Gynec checkup was normal. She was investigated for functional platelet disorders outside. But she had an unimpainful uh, two deliveries and, and tooth extraction. She was not on any medication. And then when you look at the uh, cell counter, the histogram, the platelet graph, and you know what you're dealing with, this is being flagged, as well as look at the platelets. It's showing the typical upper end, upper discriminator uh, defect of uh, having platelet clumps. And there, if you, lo and behold, on the peripheral blood, you make a uh, you see that the platelets are all clumped together. So this is what is called as EDTA-induced pseudothrombocytopenia, another little pitfall of platelets in the peripheral blood. As you know that they are normally, EDTA scatters it, but in some patients of the patients, there is this exposure of cryptic antigens on glycoprotein 2B3A by EDTA. And this is more often seen in patients with uh, autoimmune disorders. Okay, And you can troubleshoot, you can add excess EDTA, take citrated blood, manual count, However, a good look at the peripheral blood smear and you would be able to tell your clinician, look, platelets are adequate, don't worry. On contrast, a 10-year-old is early childhood, consanguineous marriage, so you are thinking of a inherited platelet disorder and we find a very low platelet count and that's usually not a part of inherited platelet uh, condition unless it's an aplastic uh, constitution. And you look at the smear and you find these giant platelets. They're really big platelets, almost the size of an RVC. We have to differentiate the large platelets that you get in ITP from the giant platelets that you get in these constitutional megathrombocytopenia. So the platelet count would have been about 80 to 85,000 in this patient, but the counter gave it as a wrong. Now again, we will discuss the platelet counting, whether it's impedance or optical. The current counters are 
better equipped with a platelet optical and the flow cytometric uh, analysis and gives a fairly accurate platelet counts. These are the abnormal platelets that you find in inherited. This is the case of Bernard Solier, inherited abnormal platelets that are seen. A 22, sorry, a 22 year old antenatal with a low platelet. And on first examination, we hardly found the platelets. They were hardly there in the smear. On closer look, under oil immersion, you find that there are definitely platelets, bizarre, large, gray, almost washed out platelets. And we came up with a diagnosis of gray platelet syndrome. What is this giant platelet? Along with the typical dull body in the neutrophils, you are able to pick up Mayheglin anomaly. This is the large platelets of ITP. Rarely would you find them of this big size. There is always a heterogeneity. If you look at the PDW, in ITP, it is pretty wide. The MPV or the platelet large cell ratio is not that great, as not as high as you get in inherited megathrombocytopenia. Giant platelets can also be seen as a part of platelet uh, in CMLs. So you get a falsely lowered platelet count with agglutination, EDTA, remember, platelet satellitism, and clots in the sample. If you look at this smear, if you find fibrin threads, you know that the sample is clotted. Don't rely on the cell counters, will not be the right values. You repeat a smear. Large platelets are also seen in Bernard Solier, ITP, myeloproliferative disorders. And it is important to note the immature reactive platelets. In this situation, the cell counter, which gives you immature platelet fraction, is of very, very important use. Because the counts may not be very uh, correct, but the IPF fraction is important. In such situations, when a patient of ITP on steroids, patient of dengue on recovery, post-chemotherapy recovery, have a look at if your uh, instrument is giving the immature platelet fraction, please have a look at it. Its rise and fall will often precede, the fall in IPF often precedes the rise in platelet count. So that's, that's an important clue to the fact that the platelets are recovering. Okay. We had this uh, primary gravida, suspected DIC. She was bleeding from venipancer sites, but the platelet counts kept coming normal. Now, what do you think is possible? You have fragmented RBC or schistocytes. So that's another cause of worry where the counter and the platelet on the smear can, can be misleading. This was another very interesting case. In fact, this was the sample that we had got. A newborn baby, peripheral smear was seen. The platelet count was 18 lakhs. Uh, we were surprised. We saw the smear. And then subsequently, uh, the, the, the technician who was on the counter came and said, okay, the next three samples that have come from uh, neonatal Viniku all have very high platelet counts. So then we figured out, and this is what is called thermal injury to the uh, smear. That is the samples we found out were kept on top of the hot air oven in the Niku. The samples that were to be sent to the lab were all placed on the hot air oven. They got heated up and got th thermal injury. A similar change can be seen in hereditary pyrocoagulocytosis. But this was a cause where we got a very falsely elevated platelet count because of direct damage to the RBCs. Another case of ALL, where interestingly, the platelets on day one was 12,000. Next day, it was reported as 2,45,000. And you know why that was. And that was because of last fragmentation. Spontaneous tumor lysis syndrome or post-therapy. The blast can fragment out. And all these fragments can be mistaken for platelets. Another of the uh, cases of spontaneous tumor lysis and blast fragments. So you get false high counts. They are rarer than pseudothrombocytopenia. You can get it in microcytosis, severe microcytosis. You can get it with fragmented red cells. You can get it with leukemic cell fragments or apoptotic cells, cryoglobulinemia, hyperlipidemia, bacteria, fungi, uh, often contamination of the stain. Uh, contamination of the sample, the EDTA sample, uh, can be uh, a part of the uh, thing. Inadvertent heating of the sample can cause all falsely high counts. So when do we look at the PS and how do we relate? When the platelet counts come low, look at the peripheral smear, confirm thrombocytopenia, and look for the underlying cause, whether it's because of Luke or DIC or whatever. When the platelet counts are very high, again, look, is it truly high or is there any... Uh, pseudothrombocytosis that has occurred and look for the underlying cause. Look at the platelet counts when the smear, when the counts are normal, but the clinician tells you, no, there is some issue. I want you to have a look at the platelets again. You probably pick up uh, lesions there. And it's good to look at not just the count, look at the platelet morphology, the functional aspect, the anisochromia of the platelets, the degranulation of the platelets, all that can be seen on the peripheral blood. 
the bugs diagnostic in infectious conditions. Usually it is malaria. Of late, however, we have getting a very low incidence of peripheral blood malaria, picking up malaria. Maybe I hope malaria is going away. Uh, we don't get too many malarial parasites to be picked up, but it's, it's usually often diagnostic. And the cell counter, most of the ones give you various, the graying, the double neutrophil, the pseudo eosinophilia, hyper eosinophilia, pseudo increase in eosinophils. All these are features of some different cases of malaria that we had. This was a newborn baby with jaundice. They were seriously thinking of a hemolytic disorder, but we picked up Vivax. This was a case suspected as dengue with a typical scatter plot of dengue, the J-shaped uh, kind of uh, lymphocyte, a monocyte kind of a clubbing, but peripheral blood showed falciparum rings. In the peripheral blood, there is another clue, especially to a malarial parasite, and that is look carefully at the neutrophils, at the monocytes, and you're going to find the plate malarial pigment. I don't think cell counters have as yet been able to pick up microfilaria. We do that. Again, the incidence of microfilaria picking up has come down, but we do get cases once in a while. Others, Babesia, Borrelia, are all picked up of the peripheral blood. So in today's world, there is still a lot to learn from the peripheral blood smear examination. The cause of anemia, particular schistocytes, and this is where I will uh, talk about the importance of the peripheral blood. I think the most important aspect is in this group, schistocytes, bite cell, sickle, spherocytes, red cell inclusion. Then platelets, thrombocytopenia and its causes. Then your leukemic and lymphoma spills and all, where peripheral blood plays a role. Causes of pancytopenia. You know, you need to interpret the peripheral blood in pancytopenia. Macrocytosis, likely MDS. Leukocyte inclusion, especially uh, toxic change, etc. And that parasites can be identified. So this is the last slide of mine. And this picture was taken maybe about 10 years ago. I had a lot more hair on my head. And we were still using the salis. Now, we don't use it so often. We were still using the uh, hemocytometer or the cell counter and tick, tick. We were going, stop, the, not too much. We use, excepting, of course, when we are doing bone marrows. The new boss chamber, once it was used for TLC, RBC, platelet, eosinophil count, no longer. It's more towards fluid counts. But the smears and the cell counters are there to stay. So we better match the smear and the cell counter values. And thank you very much for your patient hearing. And uh, good day. I'll, I'll stop sharing and get back. Thank you, Dr. <coughs> thank you, Dr. Basu, for the excellent presentation. Uh, so we have now uh, twenty-five. Uh, uh, discussion with us and at present we have 600 registrations so questions are most welcome from the audience also you can put the question on the chat box and around 20 countries are watching us starting from new zealand nepal indonesia ethiopia philippines lithuania Myanmar, etc i request uh, the all the panelists who wants to have the questions who's the raise that sign and i'll pick up the question one by one so i just start the question uh, I have one very simple basic question that we clinical hematologists face the dilemma because we see a lot of pathological reports from particularly the western part of the country. They report like that the manual machine platelet count say 42,000 and they write manual platelet count is 70 to 80,000. So they give a range. So my whole question is two. So when you report uh, low platelet count say 42,000 machine and 70 to 80,000 manual, and I'm sure they don't go by the new bus chamber counting manually. They just see the peripheral smear. And I, I'm sure they follow that. But you told that uh, 10,000 per oil is a one platelet like that we calculate. So is it really justifiable or you can ignore this type of reporting? Because problem happens to us. Many times physicians tell them that it is just a uh, benign ethnic pseudotrombocytopenia. Don't do anything like that. Or we are missing some hematological disorder. So whether you do a marrow or the basic investigations further, we are a little confused sometimes. So you just clarify this issue. Does it really matter if the platelet count is 42,000 or 70,000? I fully agree with you. Yeah. No, that's what it matters probably in a situation where previously you are dealing with a recovery of platelet count and previous days 40,000 and 70,000. It's fine. It might matter. But otherwise, 
what i hold true is if you think that the platelet count is let's say your counter is est estimating it as 42000 but on your manual examination you find it is 70000 if it is not clinically relevant accept the counts given by the uh, counter right suppose the counter says 40000 on the smear you are saying it's 1 lakh 50000 2 lakhs 3 lakhs there are clumps yes then it matters then you change your tell that this is the manual platelet count ignore the uh, counter values but if it is in a range of 10 to 20000 accept the counter values you need not even i mean i would not uh, report it out as manually it is 70000 and uh, counter it is 45000 uh, that creates more confusion so if there is a stark difference yes it matters however understood if on the smear you are finding good clumps and the counter is not giving you the adequate amount at that point of time yes it's very important to inform and i would inform the clinician that in this situation accept the manual count in that situation you can ignore the manual count and accept the cell counter so we have to be clear in our uh, statement in our opinion that's Thank what you, i would do and one more question. I, I face uh, the, interacting with uh, some of the pathologists, particularly when they see the peripheral smear, they put the manual count by seeing the platelet count only the tail end of the slides. They don't go in the body part or little deep, little uh, deeper part of the peripheral smear. So how do you see? Just you can just a little detail for the students. Or, uh, there are a lot of technicians also in the meeting today. So how you just see the peripheral smear and how you assume the platelet count? manually when you see the smear under microscope. Okay. Uh, if you look at it, uh, what I have learned and what I also uh, do, and I'm sure we have taught you, Dr. Sanyal, uh, similar things. Always look in the low power to look for clumps. At that point of time, at the edge and the uh, tail, and you look at and see if there are adequate clumps. If there are adequate clumps, I generally avoid giving a absolute count. I will say that platelets are adequate because when it is clumped, you will not be able to find out 10 platelets per oil and all that stuff goes out of the window. Okay. Otherwise, you need not just list. If you're not finding a good clump and you're getting it, you need not restrict yourself to the tail and the edge. You look at everywhere. You look at the normal zone of morphology first, where you actually look at the RBCs are separated. That's where we do not just our differential count. That is where we also look for all other abnormalities including platelets. So that's the area. You don't have to really come into the body of the smear uh, to look for platelets. If you find that is the area where if it is well distributed, you will find enough platelets to comment on. So first, yes. first, start with the edge and the tail. If you are getting good uh, things, it's fine. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, Dr. Tara, please go ahead your question. Good, good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for that very nice talk. It's regarding schistocytes. Yes, 1% is the cutoff. But and if there is thrombocytopenia, we suggest uh, possibly microangiopathic hemolytic. What do we do when you're getting some schistocytes, but the platelet count seems to be normal? Uh, does the clinician have to interpret it then? Or how do we yes, go about this? At that point of time, I think you talk to the clinicians, uh, see if it is. But if you are sure of the schistocytes and there are no other uh, RBC abnormalities, you, you tell them that it is possibly, this, this is definitely an evidence of some kind of fragmentations. You know, in, at times in TTP or in uh, HUS, you may not get a severe thrombocytopenia. So thrombocytopenia usually occurs in the setting of DIC. But in TTP, you do get, but it's not very severe. In HUS, you might get a very low platelet count. So if you are conf confident about your schistocytes, yeah. that's what I kind of insist on. That then you must inform the clinician that there are, and in a clinical setting, if your setting is there of uh, you know, bleeding or thrombotic microangiopathy and you're seeing schistocytes and you're sure that they are schistocytes, uh, patient has not been transfused or all other causes you've ruled out, yes, you should report on it. You should. One more small doubt, sir. In a thin smear when you're screening for malaria, Yes, there are clues, a little bit of polychromatophils. If you see hemozoin pigment, nothing like that. But how many fields should we tell someone to screen before saying it is negative? Nothing smear. Is there any thing like that? Is yes, we do Dr. Tejinder Singh is there. Dr. Yeah. Tejinder Singh is there. He would ask us, how long did you spend on the slide looking for malarial oh. parasite those days? Yeah. He would say at least 15 to 20 minutes. If you have seen, not found a parasite, 
Then, Go ahead. So I think I follow his dictum okay, uh, till date. Right. It's not not the number of fields; it's the time that you are spending on looking at it that you pick up. Also, I remember my uh, the other faculty member we had, Dr. Shaw, who would say that if you see if there are parasites in the smear, you will find it in the first minute of your uh, searching. So he would say that there's no point in going on and on and on. But on the other hand, Dr. Tejinder Singh, he was more meticulous, definitely. He taught us that policy of uh, looking very carefully. He would say at least spend 15 minutes. So I follow both uh, depending on the circumstance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tana. So question from the audience, Dr. Ankita Raj. What range of MCV and MCHC should be rechecked for agglutination? Is there any particular range? I'm not sure if there is a particular range, but if you find an MCH or MCHC, especially MCHC beyond 35 or 40, because you know that MCHC cannot be more than uh, 33 to 35% in situations. So if your MCH and MCHC is haywire, 50, 60, 80, 90, yes, it's agglutination. With a very low RBC count and a kind of macrocytic index. MCV high, MCH and MCHC bizarre very high okay and a very low rbc count that's the typical appearance of a agglutinated uh, field but as i showed, showed you one of uh, our cases it was absolutely within the normal range and yet it showed agglutination so i please uh, that is at least an mch for agglutination Thank you. So I don't know if there is any, but others, other range and all, I don't really. Uh, yeah. uh, Sir, if I may add on to this. So get the another question. Should we mention about spherocytes in transfuse patients in reporting? So she you must mention that. That, that there are, yeah, well hemoglobinized RBCs. That's generally what we uh, know. If we know that there are a history of transfusion or if you are not sure of whether the patient has been transfused, it's better to say, well, hemoglobinized RBCs, kindly let us know if the patients have been transfused, rather than using the words viocyte as such. You know, that, that tends to, again, create confusion. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Rudvi, your question? And please Dr. ask Dr. one question at a time. Thank okay. you, sir, for the Dr. excellent... Rudvi. Thank you, sir, for the excellent session. It was... Uh, very comprehensive and interesting. So my first question is, sir, um, uh, what is the role of morphology as compared to the cell counters in assessing the hemoglobin content of red cells and reticulocytes to identify iron deficient erythropoiesis? As you had rightly mentioned that there are the newer parameters, but available only on very few cell counters, like red HE. So if a lab does not have those cell counters, what can, can morphology provide certain views? Yes, as I said, so uh, morphology is uh, amongst all the disorders, probably in microcytic hypochromic morphology as of now uh, provides the less, uh, provides information, but not very critical information. So if you have a good cell counter and you have appreciated it, morphology is good. It will corroborate your diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia. But many a times there could be uh, other uh, you know, nutritional disorders, uh, nutritional anemia, where you may not get the typical um, microcytic hypochromic and also values, uh, which, which can give you a good diagnosis. In thalassemia trait, you have the typical you know, histogram, typical uh, CBC that gives you a good uh, diagnosis. So anyway, you will go in for an HPLC. Subtle findings like uh, basophilic stippling and target cells are there. But uh, it also needs a good stain, a proper stain to pick up stippling. So this is one situation where morphology is not very, main. it's useful, but doesn't become very critical. You can, your clinical uh, inputs and your thing, you can go ahead and get the ferritin done. Or uh, Many a times we just report it off on the cell counter that suggestive of iron deficiency anemia. Give a trial of hematonyx and uh, see if you don't have facilities for everything. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next thank question you. from Dr. Rashmi. How many fragmented RBCs for high power field is considered sig significant on peripheral smear? Again, the same, same issue as I said. Uh, according to the guidelines, one plus RBC, that is one to five percent. According to the uh, 
international uh, guidelines. Even if it is 1%, you have to report. Provided, as Dr. With, uh, Dr. Roshni, we discussed, provided it is the most prominent uh, poikilocyte that you're seeing and the clinical situation. So you must report if you're sh that there are schistocytes, 1% is also uh, enough to report on it. But that doesn't mean that every other case you say schistocyte seen, and that will confuse the clinician a lot. So you have to be very sure about identifying them as schistocyte. Dr. Jashmita? Uh, thank you, sir. This was a fantastic lecture. You sort of uh, took us through uh, hematology and revised everything uh, uh, that we could see on the peripheral smear in terms of morphology. So my question is regarding your first case. You uh, showed a case of microcytic hypochromic anemia in which uh, the hemoglobin was around 6.7, but the RBC count was sitting at around 3.5, 3.8 uh, million. And uh, in our country, um, thalassemia trait alone, IDA alone, are okay to pick up, but idea with thalassemia trait forms a very important. Uh, uh, very important. So the challenge that we face is that, as you said, the cell count, the RBC count doesn't hit that five million range. So what is uh, your practice in terms of uh, the relationship between hemoglobin and RBC count? The rough relationship that you practice to subject these kind of patients to maybe a HPLC before you give them a trial of hematomas. Yeah, very true. Very true. Uh, roughly the figure of the the. Uh, Multiplication by three, the rule of three, we do hold true. In identification cinema, it often doesn't uh, fit in, but in thals, they often match the rule of three. Yes, with a hemoglobin of six, I would exp if the if with a hemoglobin of six, an RBC count of three uh, would be those cases which are kind of query. Is it are we dealing with a thalassemia trait or associated with iron deficiency anemia? It also depends on the cases. You know, case by case, you can go ahead, but generally we follow. Uh, the problem arises when problem is easy when the hemoglobin is nine or ten. At that point of time, it's easy and the RBC. But with a low hemoglobin, I would err in favor of iron deficiency at the start. With a low uh, and a high RDW, I would think it is possibly iron deficiency. But yes, this these are the situations where we need to apply our uh, mind and see whether we are going to miss out on a thal trait with coexistent IDA. Very true. It's a true. It's it's, it's, a, it's a dilemma. So rule of three that I generally I don't really follow very significantly, but I, it's a good thing. Menzer index is another thing that you could try out, 13 or uh, above or low. So, so sometimes we need to look at that also. Yes. Peripheral smear per se is not much of a use in these situations. That's what I said. In our, If you look at all the diseases or all the entities, microcytic hypochromic anemia is one where counters... And the other ancillary, other investigations often give a better approach than a thing. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Next question is from Dr. Niru, Niru Singhal. So if you see the cystocyte-like cells on the edge of a peripheral smear, should you consider this as a significant or these are just artifact? You are seeing it only at the edge and not in the body. Yes. Then, then uh, definitely, they, I would like to either make a better smear uh, or uh, relook at it again, just by saying. Though, in my experience, fragmentation is not really much of an artifact. It's either there or not there. But if it's only at the edge, yes, I would always be very careful about reporting it out as schistocytes. Thank you, Dr. Gayatri. Please. I think you are muted. I'm doing microscopy. Thank you. Fantastic. Really treat. Really a real treat. My question is, uh, what do you think about uh, reporting on the percentage of abnormal cells, especially spherocytes, microspherocytes and fragmented cells, and using that as a monitor for progress or response? Do you do that in practice? And uh, how do you... Uh, use that well, because it is simpler to course, screen yes. peripheral smear than to follow all the other parameters for uh, yes. intravascular hemolysis. For schistocytes, for schistocytes, we do give a percentage. We do give a percentage on at diagnosis and as, as well as in the follow-up and it kind of correlates well. Spherocytes, no. I don't think a percentage is needed for spherocytes because Depending on, if it's a hereditary serocytosis, you know that depending entirely on the genetic basis, the cells become serocytes. The percentage of serocytes is there. But for, for schistocytes, yes, we do give a percentage. 
Serocytes, no. At least I don't uh, follow the percentage thing in serocytes. Or any other abnormal red cells? Other than not really. Uh, not really. Uh, no, not really. I use the percentage as a kind of a to say the severity of the disease. But I don't usually don't put it on the paper on the report. But it's just for mentally knowing that if there are like you know, too many target cells, too many NRVCs, yes, I know it's uh, too many teardrop cells, too many NRVCs. Or the, if there are so many sickle cells, I know, okay, this is definitely a patient is possibly in crisis. Uh, so for schistocytes, you report cells, yes. the percentage uh, for uh, schistocytes. You report yes. the percentage of schistocytes on all the... Uh, on all, uh, yes. Uh, on all even our clinicians also have been asking that. And generally, the recommendation is that schistocytes at least give a percentage. But uh, because, you know, otherwise we don't have really much of a thing. Some, I have seen many reports where they say anisocytosis 1 plus, poikilocytosis 2 plus. Somehow, it, I don't think it... No, unless you translate it into the, uh, it can be ambiguous, it can be arbitrary. So that way, it's okay. But for schistocytes, yes, generally we try and percentage it out. Thank you. Thank you. I know when we are used to report to Dr. Basu, if we write poikilocytosis and we don't clarify what the poikilocytes are, we have to get a severe scolding that day. That is for sure. So my next question, Dr. Basu, I just have a quick question from a clinical perspective. Uh, we do a lot of immature platelet fractions, particularly the physicians do immature platelet fractions, and then the patient comes to us for the thrombocytopenia workup and other stuff. So how do you uh, rate this uh, investigation parameter IPF? And what is your clinical intake from a pathology perspective? Yeah, I don't have, uh, I mean, IPF, uh, we've been using CISMEX, so IPF doesn't really, has not been, it's only added on. Uh, but what I have experienced with IPF is that it is a good indicator. It's a good indicator, especially when it talks about whether you're dealing, whether uh, the platelets are recovering or not. What I have seen or what I have, my experience is that dip in IPF starts before the rise of platelet count. Okay, initially the IPF is raised, then it dips, and that's when the mature platelets are pushing out. So that is a good indicator in follow-up patients, you know, dengue and all that stuff. IPF and mean platelet volume have been used. We have also used it regularly to say whether it's destructive thrombocytopenia or hypoproliferative thrombocytopenia, ITP versus aplastic. It is there, but it doesn't really form a very clinically significant kind of a parameter. But follow-up of cancer, chemotherapy, thrombocytopenia, follow-up of especially dengue and other viral infections. So looking at the IPF is useful. It's useful. It gives you a clue to the recovery of platelets. We do IPF very uh, commonly in the post bone marrow transplant recovery setting. Yes. When yeah, we, are, we, are therapy, not very, we are not very happy the way platelet in grafting, that point of time, uh, it gives us some psychological definitely. boost that if you get a 10%, 15% other than that. Otherwise, in my definitely. clinical practice, when I am not uh, very inclined to do a bone marrow test, I'm, I'm quite sure that it mm. probably a benign pseudothrombocytopenia or very mild ITP probably. I want to avoid marrow. There I use the ITP, I'm uh, sorry, IPF, uh, and then I document good IPF, just wait and watch. That is the way I do yeah, in practice. That's true. It, it is a good indicator of uh, the marrow recovery. That, that's, yeah. that's there, definitely there. So next question, Dr. Sindhura. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Vishnu, sir. It was an excellent talk. Really enjoyed this. Uh, and I have a couple of questions on the RBCs and some on the BBC and platelets. So I'll start with the schistocytes. Uh, we do report, follow the reporting guidelines uh, by the ICSH and we do uh, give percentage for uh, even the poikilocytes and spherocytes and schistocytes. And uh, I wanted to know whether you would uh, suggest us to report the different types of schistocytes in the peripheral smear reporting or like keratocytes or helmet cells and so on or not you know, really. them together? Not really. It's, it's for us to understand the schistocytes can have a varying morphology. Yes. That's what I, when I, even that article, all the articles say that it's not just typically helmet cells always. It yes. can have different morphologies. That's for us to know. But I don't think individually hair splitting as to how many are keratocytes, how many, it doesn't make sense. I don't think so. That is needed. Yes, sir. We club all of them as schistocytes. Yes, sir. Uh, 
and uh, um, our clinicians do request us uh, to follow up uh, the percentage of schistocytes serially they monitor the number yeah, I know. So I know. even we get that request i'm not sure i need to talk to the clinician as to how much uh, they they benefit out of it but as a routine practice we keep giving uh, giving but uh, i have noticed it that on recovery the schistocyte percentage going down uh, is is a feature but as i understand you know once an rbc is fragmented it is fragmented no it will remain in circulation for as long as uh, uh, there so if it is not if there is an acute hemolysis going on i would rather rely on the retic or the polychromatic or the clinical inputs than just on the percentage of schistocytes you understand i mean i i don't know i mean we do this as a practice but i'm not sure i, I think the clinicians here would maybe want to justify as to why they ask us to uh, do the percentage of how much benefit they get out of it but i don't see i don't conjecture much of a benefit because you know it will last as long as its life is there uh, the fragmented rbc would be seen so excepting yes acute hemolysis we see lots of schistocytes and if the count goes down i presume that there is no active hemolysis happening that's all Yes, sir. Thank you very I, much. I don't think so for the clinicians. We really matter about the cystocyte percentage down the line. We only matter the hemoglobin, LDH, and sometimes you have to go in just to check that. These yes. three are the most important. Those parameters. are those are other issues which help you in ongoing hemolysis. Absolutely. So we clinical hematologists never ask for this. I think one report more than enough. Right, sir. Okay, fine. Sir, Thank you. Yes, yeah, next question. Just just a second. I come back to you, but Raksha. Yes. Thank you for the great lecture, sir. Sir, my question is: What are your views on artificial intelligence and peripheral blood smear reporting? There are platforms like Cella Vision, as you have mentioned, and Sigtuple. Can we actually incorporate this in routine reporting system with benefit to the pathologist and, of course, the patient? Yeah, it's very exciting. I, I'm sure it is exciting. It is a good way to uh, learn. But till we have access to artificial intelligence. throughout all of us are getting access to it uh, we have to uh, know our morphology it is extremely useful i know it 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 will probably if it is executed well would be useful but till now another little thought that i always have is unless we know our peripheral blood properly uh, we only have to train the artificial intelligence no we have to rely on that only when we are conversant that's why i insist have a look at the peripheral smear get to know your peripheral smear well artificial intelligence cell vision is definitely going to take over uh, maybe another 20 30 years down the road when i have lost uh, it is there it's there it's exciting it is good and i'm sure uh, more advances will take place but it has to be available to all and sundry isn't it it's not just the only a niche people are using it and extolling on it unless it comes down to routine practice it is useful it is definitely useful thank you Ah, uh, Dr. Basu, you'll be very excited to hear questions from the audience. He's a student, Mitadru. Mitadru, hi. How are you, Mitadru Desharkar? Thank you for the illuminating the talk, sir. Sorry. Is there any numerical scale for the number of platelets in considering a group of platelets as a clump? Number one, and number two, and are we justified in upgrading the platelet count in a thrombocytopenia? okay uh, as i said uh, when you see a good clump you don't have to give a count as such it's impossible to you know say that it's 2 lakh 75000 or 4 lakh doesn't matter it's adequate a good of good clump of platelets 8 to 10 platelets and that's what we have been taught also if you see nice clumps of platelets just report that tell the clinician platelets are adequate it is justified to upgrade the count that's what i said if it is clinically or if it is significant upgradation 10000 20000 of platelets i feel it is 60000 when i am counting one area of uh, thing the counter has given 40000 that's not justified but if the counter has given pseudo thrombocytopenia it's thrombocytopenia on the counter but you are seeing good number of platelets it is obviously you have to inform that the platelets are adequate do a manual count you can even go by your uh, smear uh, examination if you don't put it onto the nervous chamber but there it is definitely justified reverse also if your platelet count has come high but you are realizing that's because of either fragmentation or other causes for a high platelet they are also justified that platelet count is actually low but it is uh, important you know these are important situations let's say if I, when you are following up let's say a case of itp on recovery chemotherapy on recovery the giant platelets or the large platelets may be missed on the counter 
So you could get a false low values. So at that point of time, you must inform that platelets are actually adequate. Don't worry. I hope all my pathologists are listening this. Uh, Dr. Tulsi, please. Thank you, sir. It was a very, uh, very good talk, a very comprehensive, touching on all the aspects of peripheral smear examination. My question is uh, with regards to uh, the assessing dysplasia of neutrophils in the peripheral smear and MDS cases. Sometimes I feel uh, between pathologies, it can be very subjective and it can depend upon the quality of the uh, staining quality, uh, assessing the hypogranularity. So can we use the automated uh, volume of the neutrophils and the scatter, decrease scatter and decrease volume as a more objective way of evaluating this case here in an NDS uh, scenario? Yeah, I, I'm not sure whether it is, it is objective all right, but whether it always will help one again, not all, not, all, not all of us have access to Advia or uh, these uh, uh, things which talk of its kind of courses. I would rather say that you make your stain a bit more uh, robust, the stain that you do, what stain you are using, see to it that it is there, because these findings are there, you know, visually also you can interpret. If you've seen 100 neutrophils, you will know that this is not normal. You know, so that's depending on that. So uh, those findings, your staining is good, I'm sure you'll be able to pick up uh, hypogram. And at least uh, the, the commonest of the dysbiosis that is seen in the PS is the pseudopelgaruia, the pelgaruia anomaly. Those things cannot be missed if you have enough experience. Again, as I said, these uh, various parameters that are there, they are useful. But as long as it is not uniformly available, all machines talk of, you know, depends on which machine you are using. So if that is not there, they cannot be, they are objective. There's no doubt about it. But they're kind of individually uh, catering to it. So that, that's the whole issue. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tushar? Uh, yes, sir. good morning. Uh, sir, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation, sir. To summarize all the possible abnormalities uh, on the PBF in one seminar, sir, it's, it was awesome. Sir, my question is regarding uh, cold agglutinin uh, cases. So, uh, sir, uh, uh, when we um, uh, see these uh, cases, we uh, see suspected uh, cases, we see uh, artifactual uh, alterations in the uh, RTC indices and also we tell the students to look for the sample to see for the agglutinates gross, in the gross appearance gross appearance on the vacutainer on the yes. vials and yes. uh, so in your experience how uh, much these alterations in RBC indices are there because many cases they are uh, actually they show normal MCV normal MCH and uh, so uh, we uh, see the subtle pointers that like the rule of three which is not followed usually and the low rbc yes. count and the morphology so in my experience sir, uh, the rbc indices are not very much elevated in many cases so sir uh, would like to uh, ask Precisely, that's what i also said i showed one case where the rbc indices were haywire elevated and the next slide was of where the rbc indices were actually normal but the smear was showing agglutination so your point is very well taken so it is I think you have to go case by case. Uh, if there is a clinical suspicion of cold agglutinin, make a smear, uh, irrespective of the uh, values. But generally, in at least majority of the case of cold agglutinin, what is my experience, the MCHC and MCH are abnormal. Not so much the MCV is macrocytic with a very low RBC count. You know, often it doesn't even touch 1 million. And you know, MCH, MCHC in 50s, uh, that, that's abnormal. But you see that in the majority of the cases. But yes, you are absolutely correct. In uh, places where the agglutination is not so florid, the machine might miss uh, the thing. It's also good to, uh, if, if your counts are, uh, if your uh, values are high, abnormal, you just warm the sample and rerun. That change is often another indicator that yes, you are dealing with a uh, agglutination disease. But agreed. Quite a few of the cases do not show abnormalities and those you are likely to miss unless you look at the peripheral smear. How do you find uh, in lipemic sample, how do you correct the hemoglobin and other things? They also yeah, give I know. false uh, value. Yes, they give definitely false value, especially of the hemoglobin and all. If the sample is grossly lipemic, we make a note of it uh, and put it in the report. That the sample is like we make uh, so th these values are not to be uh, really taken very seriously if they're abnormal. That, that is a major problem, I know we understand, but we are always add in the report 
lipaping sample. So please be aware of it. But you can I dilute. I don't think we, we. Yes, then we can use. Uh, we can you dilute. Can take, we can okay. dilute. Yeah. So next question is from the audience. Dr. Ifat Jamal, yeah. if we are getting only one or two platelet clumps, yeah. clumps, does it qualify for adequate? He already answered this question. Yes, it is adequate. Uh, Dr. Neetu Singhal, how you, ca you calculate percentage of cystocytes? How many fields you have to see in a smear? Yeah, like, you know, for any, any percentage calculation, whether it's reticulocyte or all, you need to see at least 10 smears, at least 10 fields of 100 RBCs uh, per field. We could also go around and count the number of fields until we reach 1,000 RBCs and then make a percentage. Let's, let's, you count as many fields as possible and then look at it. I think at least because, you have around 1,000 RBC to have a yes, proper... Yes, 1,000 RBCs. 1,000 RBCs to give counts. That's how, if you look at the older versions of Desi Lewis, for counting reticular sites also, that was the dictum. You have to count 1,000 RBCs and then give a percentage of the number of uh, reticular sites. So it's at least 1,000 RBCs has to be uh, picked up. Uh, Dr. Tathagata Chatterjee, please. Uh, good morning. A lovely lecture, of course. And I've been hearing you earlier also. So this is a personal uh, experience I just saw a case with persistent leukocytosis, uh, a case of adenocarcinoma gallbladder. Now this neutrophilic leukocytosis and neutrophilic leukobite reaction did not fit into any features of sepsis, nor was the patient on any growth factor. I insisted on a bone marrow and it was metastatic adenocarcinoma. So my question is, how often do you see such cases of neutrophilic leukopoid reaction in the solid organ malignancy, which manifests as metastatic adenocarcinoma, vis-a-vis -vis our usual teaching of a leucoerythroplastic blood picture of a myeloptic anemia. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think we just lost me. But Chatterjee, I can answer your question. So in our practice, I have seen at least one or two cases in a year because we have a huge medical oncology unit. So leukocytosis is one of the very important differential, differential in the solid tumor malignancies, particularly adenocarcinoma. So around 15,000, 16,000 WBC count without any leukoerythroblastic picture we picked up a few cases of the solid tumor malignancies. I remember two, two, three cases of the prostate, one stomach CA last year, that much I can tell you. So it is known. And always at the clinic, clinical point of view, when we are not very really sure about the unexplained leukocytosis, our MPNs are almost all ruled out. We always do a marrow and pick up this. That is a very standard practice. Yeah, the, I, I'm, I'm not very really sure that Basu is there or not, or she, he just lost him. Uh, Anyway, Dr. Jasmita, you can ask your questions. My question was regarding the thick smear. Uh, in our lab, we're not routinely practicing the thick I think, I think, Dr. Jasmita, for time being, you can ask your questions and Dr. Tejinda Singh can answer. Sir, sure. uh, do you uh, ever resort to making thick smears in your lab? Do you ever resort to? Making thick smears, even if you have a suspicion of malaria, mm -hmm. the thin smears, but... Uh, uh, how frequently or in which cases specifically would you consider making a thick smear? See, earlier we used to make thick smears while we were teaching the undergraduates. As far as postgraduates are concerned, we don't make uh, thick smears. We just make the peripheral smears. And in between, there was some talk of uh, examining the tail end of the smear. See, the malarial parasi parasitized RBCs are heavier. And when we make the smears, such RBCs are carried to the tail. That is why we are able to see a tail malarial parasite earlier as compared to the middle portions of the uh, smear. And a question to Dr. Basu. Uh, excellent. Uh... Sir, you mutated. Muted, not mutated. <laughs> 
<laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> Doctor Sir Tejinder Singh, sir, please unmute. Sir, please unmute. We can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, we came across uh, basophilic stippling. And uh, can you hear Vasu? Yeah. Okay. We can hear Vasu. Now, this uh, can we differentiate the basophilic stippling of P5N deficiency from that of lead poisoning? Are there any? I questions? can hear you, sir. Shall I repeat the question, Shall Vasu? Yes. Can we differentiate? the basophilic stippling of P5N deficiency from that of lead poisoning? I think, uh, Sanyal, you can carry over to the next uh, thing because uh, he is not able to hear properly. Dr. Yeah. Sanyal, how do you differentiate a very few lymphoblasts, leukemic blasts, from atypical lymphoid cell? See when it is a low in early cases of subleukemic leukemia, etc. How do you differentiate? See, number, uh, number one is the platelets. Usually platelets are adequate in cases of reactive lymphocytosis while the platelets are diminished. Second thing is the color of the cytoplasm. It is more basophilic whenever we have reactive lymphoid cells. And the third thing is the presence of nucleolite. Nucleoli give a clue that these are likely to be blast cells and lack of nucleolite. And fourth is we come across variation in morphology of the lymphoid cells in a case of reactive lymphocytosis. While in blast, we find by and large, they are of uniform size and shape. Even, in, of, a, even in an atypical viral infection or even infectious mononucleosis, you may find nucleolite. And at times it is very difficult to differentiate between the two, especially even in a uh, recovering dengue fever also. Mm -hmm. So in such cases, wherever there is a real difficulty, one can do either flow on the peripheral blood itself rather than resorting to the bone marrow and confirm the nature and the expression of the uh, immaturity markers like HLADR, TDT, CD10 and so on. And clinical you, background also works. Second thing, what I have faced in my clinical practice, one lab reporting platelet count 10,000, another reporting 50,000, and the patients are moving from here and there. And they are not convinced that which report is right. They come and ask us which report is right. And it is very difficult to convince the doctor as well as the patient who is right. How do you deal these problems. So these problems that we face day to day, every day, basically. Uh, so honestly speaking, in that case, as a clinical hematologist, I see all my peripheral smear and the bone marrow aspirate myself, and I take a call how to go about. So this is the only way you have to involve yourself, even in the lab, just to see the smear and give your comment and uh, give your opinion to the patient. I know it's a common problem, but it happens in our country. Sometimes we don't get a report from the, all those very particular renowned lab every time. Uh, Dr. Shashi Bansan, please go ahead with your question. Pani, everybody, it's a very nice lecture. I have just one query. Uh, in the post-COVID post -COVID patient, we used to get some plated clumps and we are not able to correct it even by the PT vial or taking the repeat sample. It is a frequent finding which we got uh, in the last six months. So uh, if the plated count by the uh, counter is coming 40,000, but manually it is around 70,000. The clumps are very small. Is there any comment about uh, these kind of uh, things in the post-COVID patients? See, I can tell you from the clinical hematologist perspective, when you are yeah. getting the clump, you just write down what Dr. Basu told, platelets are adequate, and tell, the, tell your uh, clinicians, just forget about the platelet stuff, concentrate on the other stuff of the COVID, very clear. I also get a lot of references from the COVID word like that, but your answer will be very clear. But the clumps are very small. It's around the three to four platelets. It's not a very frequent finding. Clumps, but it's, uh... So, madam, that is the thing that Dr. Basu pointed out very clearly. 
the clumps are to be considered as the adequacy of the plated clump. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I think that uh, yeah, Dr. Padiman. Sir, my question is related to uh, Basu sir, is that uh, whether the fragmented red cell uh, parameter in automated hematolo hematology analyzer can replace the cystocytes on peripheral smear? Uh, Dr. Basu is not here. Dr. Tejinder, you can answer this yes. question. See, uh, the fragmented red cells is the term we use in the peripheral blood as and when the red cells are part of the red cell has been broken off, either by mechanical forces like we find in uh, heart surgery, post-heart surgery, or in cases of DIC, or in cases of microangiopathic. That is why these are also labeled as microangiopathic hemolytic anemias. So the same red cells can, the other name is schistocytes. So there is no difference when we talk of fragmented red cells or schistocytes. What we are meaning is that it is either a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia or it is a mechanical hemolytic anemia. Okay. And sir, Thank one you. Yeah. yeah, please go sir, ahead. One, sir, one more question is that in patient... Dr. Pariman, we can't hear you. Dr. Pariman, we can't hear you. When we assume the recovery, I, I, I don't think I don't think so. We are here, able to be hearing you. Uh, any other questions from any other? Joined back. Sorry, Sorry, there was this internet glitch. I have joined back. No worries, no, sir. We managed that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I put the Dr. beginning. I'm there with you, so don't worry. No, Dr. Dr. Singh, welcome, Dr. Basu. Yeah. yeah. So, any Dr. other Dr. questions from the Dr. any Dr. other? Basu. Yes, yes, please. Congratulate you on excellent lecture. Thank, thank you, you sir. sir. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you so much. So there are no more questions from the faculty and no more questions in the chat box. It is a wonderful uh, academic feast in the Sunday morning. So now you guys are most welcome mm. to go back to your real feast of the Sunday. <laughs> or thanks, sir, for a lot of refreshing me to that. I'm just going back to my memory lane. I'm remembering by the PG days and how you used to teach us about all these basic things. And which definitely helps not only me, a lot of hematologists, a lot of students to take up the field of hematology in big way. Thanks a lot. And thanks all the panelists for your uh, for, for, uh, sharing the Sunday. And thanks all the people who are registered from the 20 different countries. Goodbye to all. Just I'm going back to Kalpesh again. Thank you Thank very you much. Very much. Sorry, I was kind of offline in the last minute. Oh, that's fine. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank and you so much for the wonderful interest, support that they always gives us for the any sort of academic meeting. And I'm really grateful to this the pharma company who actually helps us to bring together and makes us a wonderful discussion. And you all know that MHG become now is a worldwide platform in hematology. You can see the how many countries of people are actually loves to see. They actually call us. That's why we are not able to uh, log in for this meeting. And that is the way things are growing like anything. Thank you. Thank you all. And the Kalpesh for your fantastic logistic help. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And all of you have, have a wonderful day ahead. Lovely Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Manoj. Thank, thank you. you.